Uh, I think it's my role this morning to reflect on the very interesting two days we've had of talking about the neuroscience of dyslexia and talking about best practice in schools and education with educational psychologists and try to link that to the potential role that learning technologies could play in assisting teachers and learners and parents in confronting some of the disabilities that our children have to cope with. I'm not going to fight, confine the talk to dyslexia only because my own experience has been more in the context of dyscalculia, a possibly related disability in the context of number, not unlike dyslexia, it's sometimes called lack of number sense. But I think the points that I'm making in relation to the technology are equally appropriate to both of these kinds of disability. So the roles for digital technologies which I'm going to focus on are firstly to provide more productive learning experiences for learners with special educational needs. I will refer to SEN quite a lot, meaning special educational needs. Also to engage teachers in exploring new pedagogies to exploit fi the findings of neuroscience. So today I think the focus comes very much back to what role can the teachers play. And I'm interested here in looking at the way in which technology can support the teacher in the role that they play. And finally, to give parents an active role in assisting their ch own children who have special needs. I'm not going to say very much about that. I'll come back to it right at the end. So the way in which digital technologies can support the individual learner are in providing things like adaptive programs. And by adaptive, I mean a computer program that responds to the learner's own performance and the learner's own apparent needs. So it's a little like a learning game. And it operates a little like the way that a very good teacher operates. They give a child a task to do, the child struggles, and so the teacher adjusts the nature of the task to make it a little easier to take them and scaffold them through uh, more easy steps to the task they need to do. A program, an interactive computer program, can do much the same thing by looking at how fast a child responds, what kind of thing they do, whether it's accurate or whether they're struggling, and adjust the next task to them. That's what I mean by adaptive. Secondly, because we have interactive communications technologies, using these kinds of technologies, we can allow teachers to share the kinds of ideas that they have embedded in that technology program and improve on them and then share them back with the international community again. Or even use online discussion forums to share their own ideas, their own problems, the kinds of uh, techniques they've experienced as being helpful for their own learners. Those can also be made available and discussed because very often we find that special needs teachers are working very much in isolation. They may be the only teacher in their school who understands the needs of learners with special disabilities. So using the technology to enable those teachers to discuss more together can be very important. And finally, for parents, many parents in Western countries now have access online to broadband at home. That's not universal across the world by any means. But increasingly, mobile technologies are reaching even into countries where the technological infrastructure is really hardly there. But with mobile technologies, we can begin to glimpse a future where even there, it will be possible for people to become connected through the technology and thus bring parents more closely into the school environment. So those are the kinds of broad categories of contribution that learning technology can make. How does this connect up to the neuroscience? Well, if we look at the process of going from neuroscience to education, it's quite a complex process. And we begin with an inability recognized in a child or an adult to be able to deal with either reading or arithmetic. That is supposed by the neuroscientist to derive from a core deficit in the brain in the way that our neural functioning operates. So an analysis of the brain network is what the um, uh, the brain scientists have told us, shows us that dyslexics, for example, have 
one kind of dyslexia is due to phonological problems, the phonological awareness problem that we've heard so much about over the past two days. For dyscalculics, it will be numerosity problems. Numerosity problems means you cannot recognize how many things there are in a small collection. For many of us, that's a very straightforward thing, and it would be impossible to imagine that you would have any difficulty recognizing there are three cups on the table. For dyscalculics, they would have to count them. That's the difference. So that tells us something about the way in which the brain network is operating, and that loop of scientific understanding is what we've been hearing about the last couple of days. But that should also be telling us something about pedagogic design. So this is where the teachers and the learning technologists in the bottom half of the diagram start doing their investigations around what kind of adaptive intervention program, therefore, we might offer. Try it out, find it doesn't work, revisit our um, pedagogic design. So we go around that loop of educational design and practice and testing and redesign. And that should then be feeding back into an understanding of, so what exactly does it take to help improve the capabilities of these learners. So we do need that, those iterative loops, both in the science and in the pedagogy, but we do need to join them up together in a, a communal, collaborative approach to understanding how best to help these learners. So coming to the neuroscience and the cognitive defi deficits, as we're aware, dyslexia can be a specific deficit in, for example, phonological awareness. So we look, therefore, for interventions in phonological awareness. How do we help those learners become aware of the way phonemes are made up, of how syllables are constructed within words, of how graphemes are constructed within, within syllables, of how phonemes relate to each other to make a syllable? And through those interventions, we look for improvements in performance. We should also be looking for changes in brain activity. So that's where the pedagogy would link up back to the way in which um, we understand how the, the brain is, is, is operating as a result of the learning. But the extent to which we've been able to tackle that problem is still in the relatively early stages, which is why I put a question mark there. Adaptive programs for dyslexics, the kind of thing that, that can be done here, and that here I'm referring to the work of Bruce McCandless, who showed that if you have a series of syllables and you're trying to get learners to understand how those syllables are constructed, moving from sap to tap to top to stop to top to top. You give the learner um, a, a constructed initial word like sat and a number of letters which they can use to exchange with different parts of that word. You highlight the one that they've got to change in order to move to the next one. So in order to move to sap, I've got to focus on that T. So the learner knows they have to bring in a P. Now we've managed to do SAP. Now the next one is TAP. What do I need to focus on to look at that? The S. Bring in the T, and that's TAP done. So the program is always trying to help the learner focus on the appropriate part of the word to transform it into the next word in the list. When we get to TOP, we can't give them any hint because it's an addition of a new uh, letter, S to make stop. Now to make top, we can highlight the S needs to be focused on and they just need to take it away. To get tot, we focus on the P and change it to a T. So the child's attention is always being focused on that part of the sequence of letters that they need to look at to be able to change it. So sequences of letter changes were developed so that when possible, attention is drawn to each position within a word form. And as McCandless reports, this kind of technique led to gains for all the participants in their study. And that kind of program, that adaptive program, helping the students see what they've got to focus on next and giving them the task of creating that, that change is the kind of thing that the technology can support very well. So that's what we look for in capturing the pedagogy that McCandless and indeed other teachers have been using for a long time, and we've seen um, a number of examples of good pedagogy in the conference already. Some of that can be captured in the technology to support uh, the learner as they're learning. 
Now, dyslexia and dyscalculia do often occur together. And those of you who work with children with special needs, uh, who uh, here you're focusing on dyslexia, you will almost certainly also find that some of those learners have other kinds of problems as well. Sometimes it's called dysgraphia they, uh, or dys, uh, dyspraxia. They have difficulty in manipulating. But some of them will also have problems with dyscalculia. They will have problems with number as well as with reading. The prevalence of dyslexia is somewhere, estimates vary between 3 and 5 percent, sometimes as much as 6 percent. I think we've even seen higher estimates than that in some of the talks over the last two days. Prevalence of dyscalculia, again, estimates vary, is somewhere around 3 to 5 percent. But the low numeracy and the low, low literacy co-occurrence can be a 40% overlap of those with one or other difficulty. So that if you have a population of students who have low numeracy and another population of students who have low literacy, 40% of those will have both kinds of, of disability. So it is quite likely that if you have learners with dyslexia, they will also, some of them, have some problems with dyscalculia. How we identify these, um, there are a number of definitions of dyscalculia, and one of these um, uh, screener tasks developed as a program which runs both on a standalone computer and online from, from a website will allow you to test learners to find out the extent to which they have that kind of difficulty. And I'll come back to some of those problems in a minute. So this screener developed by Professor Brian Butterworth at University College in London is available online. Why should this be important? Well, a number of studies um, that we've seen already at the conference have told us about the kinds of difficulties that these learners have in later life if their disability has not been treated. Some of the work done in my own institute, the Institute of Education in London, tells us what happens if these learners are left un, uh, unsupported into adult life. The effects of dyslexia and dyscalculia, uh, of low numeracy and low literacy on adult life are quite significant. At age 30, they are likely to be unemployed. They are likely to have no work-related training, no use of a computer at work, no maternity or paternity leave. They don't own their own home. They live in a non-working household. They have no political interest. They're likely to have been in jail. They're likely to suffer from depression. So those are all increased probabilities for that, uh, for that group. Um, an additional finding of the, of the study by Parsons and Binner was that for women, even when the highest qualification was controlled, poor numeracy, quite independently of poor literacy, predicted most of the negative outcomes in adulthood. It's even more difficult for women to get the kinds of jobs which, uh, which low socioeconomic group women get um, if they have poor numeracy. This was something reflected also, I think, in something which Linda Siegel said yesterday. 75% of the prison population in her study in Ontario had learning difficulties. So that takes you through into adult life. That's why it's so important for us to capture these problems early and to do what we can to remediate them. And some of those people there are the stories of, of Ishan that we saw in that uh, Indian film, fascinating Indian film that we saw the other night. That's what happens to the Ishans when they don't find the teacher who can help them. So coming back to the neuroscience and cognitive deficits, what dyscalculia means then is in a sense, a lack of number sense. So what we look for, just as with dyslexia, is interventions on numerosity tasks which will lead to improvements in performance and perhaps also to changes in neural activity. But so far, there has been far less work on dyscalculia than there has on dyslexia, so we're much further behind. We're at least 10 years behind in understanding exactly what the nature of the problem is and in understanding exactly what the nature of the remediation is. Let me try and give you an illustration of what happens for a child who is dyscalculic. In a task like this, where they're asked to place an eight card in an array where they know where the four is and they know where the nine is. And what they have to do is decide where on that list 
the, um, where in that sequence the eight lies. Now, for most of us, it's not too difficult to see that that number of dots would probably um, fall fairly near where the nine card is. But the dyscalculic counts in order to find where the eight goes. It's not something they can see. They have to count. And in this case, she misses, and she has to start again, because the nine didn't coincide with where the nine card was. This time, the four coincides with the four. She's counting up, seven, eight, nine. So now she knows where the eight is, and now she can place the eight. So it's a very different kind of behavior. It's, it's, it's the problem of not being able to see that relationship between a group of eight dots and a group of nine dots. Always they have to check by counting. And in that case, in order to identify the eight card, she wouldn't be able to see the pattern. She would have to count the number of dots. So they have no problem in counting sequences. They could d recite the, uh, the numbers one to 10 just as well as they could recite the alphabet. But they see it as being rather like the alphabet, just an arbitrary sequence of sounds. But making that relationship to the number of dots is what's very difficult for them. In progress at the moment is a twin study um, looking at evidence of dyscalculia where there is a significant difference in between numeracy tests and IQ tests for some 7% of the sample. So those are the ones where you, you might be quite likely to find dyscalculics in that nearly 7%. And this is within twin studies looking at the heritability of this kind of problem. What they find is that dyscalculics are significantly worse on problems like dot enumeration where you have a, a collection of dots and you have to say how many are there. Let me see if you, we, you've already had a, an interactive task in the conference previously. What I want you to do now is see if you can quickly say in the next visual that I put up, how many are there in this collection of dots? Are you ready? Pretty good. Now, Another kind of task which dyscalculics find very different, which is the larger number? You ready? Yes, very good. And which is more, left or right? Yes. Well, now that would take, a, a dyscalculic would count both sets of dots and decide which is the larger, knowing which number comes after four. So that's the kind of difficulty that we're, we're trying to contend with. And whether it's a, a, where it is in the brain, um, whether it's a core deficit, whether it's a similar kind of deficit to what happens in, in dyslexia, um, the, the jury is still out. We're still doing that, that kind of, of analysis. From the twin study, it looks as though it could be heritable. If one or other parent has that kind of problem, just with, as with dyslexia, there is a greater likelihood that the child could have it. And it affects some, maybe 3 to 5% of the population but it can be diagnosed through that kind of problem. So that's what the dyscalculia screener will do. It will help you identify which of your children have that kind of difficulty. But how then do we go from this diagnosis to an educational remedy? We may know what the difficulty is, but that doesn't mean that we can deduce what therefore the pedagogy should do. There's no clear logical pathway between the two. So what we're doing is trying to use established pedagogical principles use ideas from the best practitioners, from the teachers who are working with these children every day and who understand what they need and have practiced using exercises, but using technology to capture and test the best ideas. So working across the disciplines, we begin with a brain analysis which says, we know that for dyscalculics there is, for example, reduced brain matter density here. That creates guidance for teachers to say, they have a problem with dot enumeration, rehearse those kinds of dot pattern recognition tasks. The teacher's practice focuses on learners learning how to construct those kinds of dot patterns, just as we saw with learners trying to construct syllable changes within the dyslexia um, practices. We create adaptive programs which give feedback to the learner on how well they've done, and I'll give an example of that in a minute. The program records how fast they react, how accurate they are, and adjusts the task to help them gradually learn to stop counting and recognize the dot pattern. And those um, programs are then made available on a website, which enables the teachers to engage with how well these programs are doing, whether we could um, offer better ideas for their further development. 
So there should be a, a continuous process of interaction and iteration across all of those disciplines. Why is it important? Well, one of the studies shows us the kinds of uh, difficulties that, um, that these learners experience in the classroom, which you will recognize from your work with dyslexics. The moderator in this interview session with um, focus groups with children in primary school says, how does it feel? How does it make people feel in a maths lesson when they lose track? The child says, horrible. Horrible, why is that? I don't know. The child's friend says, he does know. Just a guess. You feel stupid. Another child says, it makes me feel left out sometimes. When I don't know something, I wish that I was like a clever person, and I blame it on myself. I would cry and wish that I was at home with my mum, and it would be, I won't have to do maths. These are incredibly difficult emotional traumas for these children to deal with. Being in a mainstream classroom, being taught along with other kids, feeling stupid, feeling left out, feeling desperate sometimes. Just the same for dyscalculics as it is for dyslexics in that kind of position. So we look to these teachers to give us ideas about what goes on within that one-to-one -one interaction that we can capture in an adaptive computer program. What the SEN teachers do is to work with a number of, of individual tasks to, to pair up the children, to get them talking about the mathematics, to manipulate special materials, to get the children to describe what they're doing, to get them to verbalize and articulate what's going on in the mathematics, and to use games as much as they can. Now, within the context of using computer programs, we can't deal with talk very well, but we can at least deal with practice. <clears throat> so the pedagogical principles we're, we're basing some of these programs on refer back to the ideas of constructionism, which came from Simon Papert at MIT, who developed the Logo Turtle, which some of you may have come across, which concretizes and externalizes geometrical ideas, making the children make a triangle or make geometrical objects and construct them themselves. And the whole point of constructionism is to make the task goal meaningful to the learner, to let them do something to try and achieve that goal, give feedback in relation to the goal, and then motivate their revisions um, and actions to improve their task on that goal. So that's the kind of thing that a computer program can be extremely good at. It's the kind of thing that good SEN teachers naturally do. But the teacher has to be there all the time. The teacher has to be helping the learner through each of those stages. So there is some success for special needs teachers. They've found the pedagogies that work with students, but they're limited, and they're local, and they're difficult to share with the thousands upon thousands of teachers all over the world who are finding students with the same kind of problem. So what we look to the technology for is to, is to identify a clear task goal, as in a game, to give intrinsic feedback on actions. And intrinsic feedback means Feedback which is related to the action you're making. So it's like trying to kick a goal through a goal post. You kick and you see that it goes to the left, too far to the left, so you think, okay, I need to kick further to the right. That's intrinsic. It's not somebody saying, you got it wrong, try again. It's not somebody saying, do it differently, hold your leg this way. It's, I can see what I have to do. That's the meaningfulness of that action. Learners can revise actions using their feedback, therefore. It's adaptive to learner performance because it can track how fast the learner is learning and adjust the next task to what they need. The learner can do it on their own, at their own pace. It can support repeated practice, which is exactly what they need to do it over and over again and keep coming back to it. And we look for simple interfaces. Angela Fawcett the other day mentioned that in the, with the problem of training dys dyslexic learners. They go away and it's as if and then when they come back it's as if you'd never taught them anything. Because with a break in the teaching the child remains unsupported and they revert to their previous knowledge. <coughs> Heinz Wimmer yesterday said the same thing. After all that training over three weeks it was a serious and persistent problem. Even after the training had been successful they come back, they have a break and they've lost it again. And that's a very common experience of teachers. 
what the technology could do is stay with the child so the child can carry on over the weekend, over the summer vacation, and continue and practice that rehearsal. There is some numeracy software around to help these learners. Um, this is, <coughs> a lot of it is much too busy and confusing and dyscalculic learners get easily distracted. This, I'm giving a version of it because I don't want to show the exact program because it would be rather unfair to that commercial enterprise to criticize their program in this way, but it's the kind of thing you very often see. So in this task, they say have, have to say how many dots. But you have two rows of numbers, one of which on the right-hand side is showing which task they're on. This is the third task in the sequence. The bottom numbers are the ones they have to click on and choose in order to answer the question. So the child will choose number three, let's say, and what they see is their three against the four. So it's a confusing interface. They're told the answer is four, but what happens is that the answer is conflicting with the action that they've just made. They get extrinsic feedback just saying that it's wrong. It doesn't help them to see how it's wrong or why it's wrong, so it's not meaningful. So they're not having to change their action. They're not having to revise their action. They just try again. So it's very difficult with some of these um, software programs to see what we can do to, to really help the child um, who is having those kinds of problems. Another set of programs which was developed, especially for children who lack number sense, was developed actually here in Paris by Professor Stan Dehaan and, and colleagues. And by the way, the, uh, the, the references for all this are available in the PowerPoint, which will be available on the website. So, uh, so you will have access to the papers that describe this work. And here, they're trying to get students to rehearse exactly that relationship between understanding which is more, four or five. And so they are helping them to rehearse that their understanding and interpretation of those patterns. And then move them gradually on into interpreting those in the normal arithmetic expression of what six minus four equals two means in terms of how dots behave and how they, how they move the dots around in order to get the arithmetic solution. So what they're trying to do with these adaptive programs is enhance the child's number sense, assist the links between the symbolic and the concrete so that that becomes meaningful and conceptualize the arithmetic. And one of the things they found was that specific increases in performance on core number sense tasks for those students with that kind of program. What they haven't been able to find um, at this stage is whether that perseveres, whether they remember it. And again, if the child has their own access to the technology, they could keep rehearsing these kinds of things. An intervention study in progress now is looking at um, learners with, uh, who are eight or nine years old and still having these kinds of problems, identified by teachers comparing those with normal groups, and working, for example, on dot enumeration tasks and recognizing the relationship between numbers and digits. So just to give you an idea of these, it would take too much to actually run them properly, but this gives you a sense of what kind of thing they are. They have number patterns, uh, sorry, digits and dot patterns, and they have to click on uh, a yellow card and then click on the matching digit. As they work through, the, the program gradually adapts to giving them more and more cards to pair up, and as they get an answer right, then the cards move down to a pair, and they get progressively fewer that they have to match. So it gives them a lot of iterative um, practice at the relationship between the number of dots and the digit. In a different kind of program, they have to do this in more of a memory task, where they turn over two cards, and if they match, that's fine, and if they don't, they have to try again. Now they've found a matching pair, and so that is, is, is put away, and now they've only got to work with four of them. Um, <clears throat> what they have to do in this case is to try to remember where the four pattern was or remember where the three digit was in order to take the next go. So the, the kind of uh, task which the teachers are using with, with students, which is now available on, on computer, is moting that memorization of dot patterns. An adaptive program that we're also using um, asks students to type in how many there are. Let's say they type in five for a pattern of six, and they're shown this is the five pattern. So your input 
generates this pattern. Then it slowly counts down the correct pattern onto a number line. So they see the relationship between the pattern and why it should be five in relation to the number line. Then they do their pattern, count it down, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then they ask them to fix their line, either by adding one or taking one away. So they, they click on the take one away, and it removes that, and now we can see that I've made the pattern of five in relation to my number line. So it's, they're able to repair what they've done. They're able to see the relationship between the two. So it shows the results of the learner's inputs, it shows the meaning of patterns in relation to the number line, and it tracks their accuracy and speed of response. So you can see that for a learner who is having some difficulty, their reaction time is quite low for numbers one, two, three, four, five, up to about, up to about four. There's quite a, a low response time down here. As they get to the higher numbers, their response time gets very high. So that's what the program can track. So it can say they need a lot more practice on six, seven, and eight, so we'll rehearse those a lot more. And then eventually, they get reaction times which are all very low, no matter what the number is. Now, it's very hard for our pupils to get to that point. This is more like what a normal student would be able to do. But to get dyscalculic students down to that kind of performance is very difficult. So the learner model is interpreting how well the child is doing and reacting to it. That's what we look, look to the technology to do. So one child um, gradually uh, begins to, to work until they can recognize the number pattern, but, but we need them to recognize it fast. So the other thing the, the program does is to limit how long they can see it. And then gradually they work up to being able to do it faster and faster until they can recognize that pattern. So what this means is that we have the opportunity for teachers in schools to be looking at how well these programs work with their students. And they're customizable because the teacher can decide which numbers do they work on. I'm going to edit in the numbers, the, the sequence of numbers I want my students to do and how fast they have to be able to work. So teachers can redesign the program as they experience using it with the children. And their pedagogic ideas can be captured digitally in the program. And not only that, but they can share it with other, with other teachers. Submit it to the online website, and they are able then to discuss what they've done with their learners, what their experience is. And not only discuss with other teachers, but also feed the ideas back to the designers, because we don't necessarily know how, well, how best to work. The people who are working every day year in, year out, with those learners understanding what they need, are the teaching workforce. So it's their knowledge that we need to get back into the system. So the idea of using the technology to enable teachers to act as co-researchers is very important. That's our website. It's called Developing Number Sense. Um, Lownumeracy.ning.com. Please take a note of it. Please come and have a look. Join us on the website. Offer your comments download the programs, we will be delighted to hear from you because then you will become co-researchers with us on looking at which are the tasks that really help these students. How long does it take them? How many do they need? Over what sort of period does it become helpful? And what more do you as teachers need? So to summarize then, I think the point of technology for special needs interventions is for the learners to offer that opportunity for unsupervised repeated practice at home, on the bus going, going to and from school, instead of playing a Nintendo game to be playing um, a numeracy game, offering virtual environments that link the physical to the abstract in a way that we can't do in the real world. And for teachers, capturing their pedagogic ideas, enabling them to customize the task, to adapt it to what their learners need, and enabling teachers to share effective pedagogic practice. So in summary, adaptive programs provide more personalized practice for learners who need more time and attention. Both dyslexia and dyscalculia could benefit from digital interventions on special needs pedagogies and the neuroscientific indicators of likely need. And it's the teachers who are critical to building our knowledge of successful interventions. 
Technology, communications technology can link them to each other and to the researchers and to the designers. Thank you. Professor Lorillard, thank you very much. Really uh, fascinating introduction to a condition certainly I knew absolutely nothing about. Um, and that one itself was revealing, but also the idea that there's technology that can provide uh, persistent um, support to those learners in an adaptive way, I think is a really, really interesting and revealing.